sorry. Now that we have that nonsense out of the way, let's pray. Prepare our hearts to hear from God's Word. Well, Father in heaven, we come before you this morning admitting our great need for you. We are in need of your grace this morning. We, Father, thank you for the gift of your word and ask you now to speak to us. Father, as our minds are anxious about a great number of things this morning, I pray that you would help us now to actively cast them upon you. Cast our anxieties upon you, Father, knowing that you care for us and that you know about every need that we have. And so we trust you with these, Father. We trust that you're about to address us, Father, through your word and that by your spirit, you are at work even now, conforming us to the image of your Son and our Savior, Jesus Christ, from one degree of glory to another as we behold your glory. Father, I pray this morning that you would refresh your people that you would melt our hard hearts, convict us of areas in need of change and comfort us, Father, in every affliction. Above all, Father, I pray that you would open our eyes to see your glory, that our faith this morning might be strengthened. We thank you for this time and ask now all of these things in the name of our King Jesus. Amen. All right, Acts chapter 19, verses 11 through 20, please Follow along as I read to you from God's holy and authoritative word. And God was doing extraordinary miracles by the hands of Paul, so that even handkerchiefs and aprons that had touched his skin were carried away to the sick, and their diseases left them, and the evil spirits came out of them. Then some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists undertook to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits, saying, I adjure you by the Jesus whom Paul proclaims. Seven sons of a Jewish high priest named Siva were doing this. But the evil spirit answered them, Jesus I know and Paul I recognize, but who are you? And the man in whom was the evil spirit leaped on them, mastered all of them and overpowered them so that they fled out of that house naked and wounded. And this became known to all the residents of Ephesus, both Jews and Greeks, and fear fell upon them all. And the name of the Lord Jesus was extolled. Also, many of those who are now believers came confessing and divulging their practices. And a number of those who had practiced magic arts brought their books together and burned them in the sight of all. And they counted the value of them and found it came to 50,000 pieces of silver. And so the word of the Lord continued to increase and prevail mightily. May God preach, may God bless the preaching and the reading of his holy word. Well, over the course of the last year, we have slowly been making our way uh, through the book of Acts, uh, slowly, and we are picking up the pace here in the, last, uh, in the last section of the book. We're going to be making our way through the rest of this book at a more rapid pace. But we've been studying this book of Acts, looking and learning and studying about the advance of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We've been asking God to use us in a similar way to work in our church, to work in our community, uh, to shape us and mold us and to use us by the power of His Holy Spirit. We've seen how Acts is the story of the gospel going out and succeeding, overcoming every obstacle, overthrowing every boundary of geography or ethnic group, social class, or background. Jesus said during His earthly ministry, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And just before ascending back to heaven, he said in the book of Acts to his disciples, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Clearly, God intends this good news about Jesus Christ to go out into all the world, to all people, and to use this good news to redeem a people for himself. We've seen this throughout the book of Acts. We have seen the word of God prevailing. We've seen the number of followers of Jesus increasing, the church of Jesus Christ growing, the gospel going forth and redeeming people, and it continues to do so among us today. This gospel, it is glorious, it is hope-filled, and it is powerful. This gospel that we treasure, that we trust, that we are, that we are seeking to live out and apply to our lives, it is unstoppable. 
and powerful, but it is also something else. This gospel is also transforming. It, tra- it has a transformative work among the people whom it comes into contact with. It stirs things up. It provokes things. It unsettles things. It transforms our own personal lives as well as our societal lives, the way that we live among the people in our city and our culture. And that's what we see here in Acts 19. Here's the truth that we see here in this passage this morning, is that wherever the gospel goes, it transforms God's people and prevails over every obstacle. It shakes things up. It shakes up the status quo, and it destroys the idolatries of those who embrace it. We want to see that here, the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. It comes in and transforms the wrongness, the sickness, the brokenness, idolatries at work in our lives. In fact, it aims to let loose all of that and to set us free in Jesus Christ. And that's what we see here in this section of Scripture this morning, is we see God setting free people from idolatry. We see God transforming the lives of those whom the gospel comes into contact with. We're just going to look at this this morning in three simple points, and they flow right out of this passage. The first one is this. God is the active agent in the advance of his gospel. So right away, we see extraordinary miracles going on. We see miracles. Now, we're not unaccustomed to reading about miracles in the scriptures, but even here, Luke takes, you know, emphasizes these aren't simply miracles. They're extraordinary miracles. So there were miracles, and then there were extraordinary miracles. Here, we see that handkerchiefs and aprons that had touched Paul's skin were being used to heal people of their diseases and to ward away evil spirits handkerchiefs, and aprons. These were, these were likely items that were connected to uh, Paul. Uh, Paul's working with Paul. Paul was a uh, bivocational guy. He was a tent maker by trade. That was how he, uh, how he provided you know, and, and paid for the way for him to do his gospel work when he wasn't being supported by churches. And so these were items that were likely connected. So he had handkerchiefs and aprons, I guess, were the, you know, some of the trade tools of the, of the tent maker. And you see that people were taking uh, anything of his that they could get their hands on. And they would take it, and, and it was, you know, was kind of like a, you know, something that they would prize. And then they, they would actually use that, and it would ward away evil spirits and heal people of their diseases. This is similar to something we read in Luke chapter 8 when, uh, when a woman touches the hem of Jesus' garment. Remember this? This woman touches out, she reaches out, touches the hem of Jesus' garment, and by that very act, she is healed. Or in Acts chapter 5, people were actually laying their sick in the streets. They heard that Peter, the apostle Peter, was coming to town. And so they took their sick and they drug them out into the streets and laid them there, hoping that Peter's shadow would, would walk by and cast its shadow on them and that they would therefore, therefore uh, be healed by that. This, these are extraordinary miracles, not just your run of the muck miracles. You know, I mean, miracle, as far as I understand, by very definition is something that is extraordinary. But these are something extraordinary, extraordinary if you will. Miracles are God's exclamation point, if you will, on gospel ministry. They're God's way of attesting to the message that his people are proclaiming. This is God putting his stamp of approval on their work. The point for Paul, though, wasn't to draw attention to himself. You can imagine what it was like if you had that power, if you had the power to do miracles. I mean, imagine that you wake up in the morning, you say breakfast, boom, bacon and eggs, boom, No traffic. Boom. (laughs) Can you imagine that having that kind of power? And you would you would do that and you would call attention to that. You'd say, look what I can do. You you know, I've got five boys and I hear a lot in my house, Dad, Dad, look what I can do, and they do something. Imagine if they had this kind of power. But Paul wasn't drawing attention to himself like Simon Magus back in in Acts chapter eight, or as we're about to see with these Jewish itinerant exorcists in this next section. No, the power that God granted to Paul and to others in Scripture was never used for their own end, for their own fame, for their own notoriety, but for advancing the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ in the world. That was what they were about. And so if we want God's blessing in our lives today, we need to place ourselves in that same mindset, being about that mission and not our own, praying for power to persuade, and then you'll see the power of the Holy Spirit coming upon you and, and working in your life. As you know, and you know, I've found it true in my life that the times I sent the Holy Spirit's leading, the times that I've sensed the, the Holy Spirit's power more than any other is when I'm seeking to come alongside others with the gospel. 
Do you find this true in your life? When you, when you come alongside somebody and you're seeking to you know, speak a word uh, toward evangelism, or if you're just seeking to minister to someone, it's in those moments that God brings to mind words, that God sets up situations and circumstances so that you'll be, be able to minister more effectively. This has been true in my life. Many times when I've had evangelist conversations that came about because I stopped and considered a person. You see you know, this throughout Scripture. You see Paul considering people. You see Peter stopping and connecting with people. And oftentimes that's where it starts is when you stop and connect with somebody. You draw them out and you find out that there's something going on in their life and you stop to care for them. And you say, tell me about that. And you stop to pray for them. You say, and not just saying, I will pray for you, but stopping and actually praying for them, and you see God meet you and God at work. That's the model for us today, that we want to follow like Paul. We want to remember who we are, that we are God's ambassadors. We're set apart for his mission to make his fame known of advancing the gospel. When we look for opportunities to connect meaningfully with our neighbors and our coworkers, anyone that God places in our proximity. I just continue to go back. I've said this, I've repeated this quote from John a number of times that I love that he drew our attention to a few years ago, that proximity equals responsibility. I just love that idea that wherever we are, we think about who's right around us. We don't have to go to the ends of the earth, literally, to advance the gospel. We can just think about who's right around you in your immediate context. Well, it's the other parents on, that, on your kid's sports team, or it's your coworkers, your neighbors, whoever it is that's right around us. We want to advance the gospel in that proximity. But we don't want to forget the point here because we can easily get carried away with the idea that it's up to us to advance the gospel. But who is doing the miracle here? It says it right there at the beginning. God was doing extraordinary miracles by the hands of Paul. It was God who was working. It was God who was doing the miracles. Paul was just the vessel. Paul was just the instrument, if you will. Paul was standing there, and God worked through him, and God works through you and me today. God is the one who has worked throughout this passage in the entire book of Acts, sovereignly working, doing miracles, healing people, drawing them to himself. And this gives us great confidence today. Like we see with Paul, God will be present with us as we seek to join him in the advance of the gospel. All right, so that's, for, that's point one. God is the active agent in the advance of his gospel. Secondly, God will not, God will not be mocked, and counterfeits will be exposed. So Paul is, Paul is proclaiming the name of Jesus, and he's healing diseases, and he's casting out demons, and apparently his example prompted imitation. And so you have these Apparently, there's such a thing as an itinerant Jewish exorcist. It's a unique job title. And these guys figured out that the secret to successful spiritual power was to simply mention the name of Jesus. These guys, mind you, they were not believers. They weren't converted disciples of Christ. Rather, they were frauds. They were counterfeits. They were pretenders. They wanted to use the name of Jesus like a, like a magic formula. And they don't even pretend to be followers. Look at this. It says that, I adjure you by the Jesus whom Paul proclaims. I mean, it doesn't get much more awkward phrasing than that. I adjure you by the Jesus whom Paul proclaims. So they weren't even, even you know, communicating that they had any personal intimate knowledge of this Jesus. Rather, it was like a, a formula uh, that they wanted to recite. These jokers were going around not for the sake of the gospel, not for God, not to serve others, to bless others, but they were going around to spread their own fame, their own notoriety. In fact, it was pointed out that they are, they're referenced as the sons of a Jewish high priest named Siva, but in Jewish records, there is no high priest named Siva. And so they were, they were even putting on pretenses of some notoriety that they had no claim to whatsoever. So they're seeking their own fame, their own notoriety. But as men and women created by the image of God, created in the image of God, by God, we are called to proclaim him. We are called to live for him, for his fame, and to give our lives for building his church, not our own. Not our own kingdom, but his. They said, look at us. We are called to say, look at him. So these guys are trying to use the name of Jesus like, like a magic formula to accomplish their own purposes. And what happens? Verse 15. Look with me. It says, but the evil spirit answered them. I love this part. Jesus I know, and Paul I recognize, but who are you? And the man in whom was the evil spirit leaped on them, mastered all of them, and overpowered them so that they fled out of that house naked and wounded. 
This is something like a reverse exorcism, isn't it? Not what they expected to happen. Not what anybody expected to happen. Seven men mastered by one. They commanded the demon to come out. The demon whoops up on all of them. They run away without their clothes on. It doesn't get much more embarrassing than that. Paul commands the demon to come out, and it obeys. These seven brothers attempt a trick, and they run away naked, injured, and, and degraded. Friends, God is not fooled. He's not mocked. God knows all, and he sees all. And the demons also know the difference. The demons also know the difference between those who genuinely work in God's name and a group of pretenders. Listen, friends, God, God is not a power to be manipulated, but a God to be worshipped. Jesus is not a name to be used, but a name to be extolled. The gospel is not simply our sin being canceled and then power to live a life of prosperity and going about our own business. A lot of people think today, like these Jewish itinerant exorcists, of the gospel is simply a power, a, maybe a get-out-of-jail-free card. It's a way of escape. And then they think of their Christian life as maybe becoming a little bit more moral, a little more ethical in their, in their practices, maybe dropping a tip in the offering plate as it comes by and then going about their own lives without any reference to God's will and to God's desire, to God's um, plan for their lives. But we know that's no different than the way the Ephesians viewed the false gods of their day. They viewed them the same way. That's not the gospel. God doesn't simply want you to be a nicer person. He wants you. He wants your heart, not just part of it. He wants all of it. He wants you to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. So not just to pay pretense to him. Jesus is not a means to an end, but he is rather the greatest gift that we could ever have. So we want to seek the giver of the gift and rather than the gift itself. The gospel, the gospel is not the benefits of a life with God, but God himself is the gospel. Now then, a quick word, just a quick word on spiritual warfare. We read in passages like this, and oftentimes we can respond in a couple of different ways. Some of us may respond and say, yes, now we talk about the power. Now we have, you know, talk about how to wield power in the world. Or some of us might respond with our rational minds and simply dismiss this kind of activity as the results of some ancient superstition uh, that doesn't happen today. And it's here that we must not blush at the truths revealed in God's word. Spiritual warfare is a reality. The devil really does prowl around like a roaring lion today. But the lesson here is that Jesus' name is not a magic formula. It's not a lucky charm to bring out whenever you need it. That's not how it works. Demons are real in this world. The work of the enemy is evident everywhere. But they are overcome not by speaking the right incantation, but by those who have a genuine relationship with God and who proclaim his authority and his dominion over all things. The power over evil spirits and, and sickness and everything else that we see here, every bit of it is a result of the redemptive work of Jesus Christ on the cross. It's a result of his work. When Jesus died on the cross, Jesus defeated death, declared victory over every spiritual power at work in the world. Hebrews 2.14 says that Jesus, through death, rendered powerless him who had the power of death, that is, the devil. Colossians 2.15 says... At the cross, God disarmed the principalities and powers and made a public example of them, triumphing in power over them in Jesus. Wayne Grudem, in his book <clears throat> that I commend to you, Systematic Theology, says this. He says, because of Christ's death on the cross, our sins are completely forgiven and Satan has no rightful authority over us. Our membership as children in God's family is the firm spiritual position from which we can therefore engage in spiritual warfare, knowing that God has given his children divine power to destroy strongholds. There's obviously a lot more to say about spiritual warfare here, and at some point you know, we'll, we'll have a, a greater teaching on it. But let's keep in mind here the main point that God will not be mocked, that counterfeits will be exposed. Jesus' name is not a lucky charm. The Christian life is about much more than that. So God is the active agent in the advance of the gospel. He will not be mocked, and counterfeits will be exposed. And thirdly, God transforms his people as his word prevails in their lives and in the world. 
as a result of what, the, um, of what these people saw, as a result of this reverse exorcism, if you will, widespread fear falls upon them all, it says. And the people revered the name of Jesus. They began to extol his name all the more. And many of those believers, apparently overcome by the fear of the Lord and conviction from the Spirit, began confessing their secret sins and divulging their magical practices. It seems that some of these people had some kind of, um, some kind of magic books or scrolls full of incantations. And so they kind of, um, you know, somebody had a problem. They said, hey, I've got a spell for that. I've got this ailment. Hey, I've got a cure for that. I've got this charm that I can whip out and put and apply here. It seems that maybe some of these people kept this as some sort of insurance policy in, in case the, uh, uh, the whole Christianity thing didn't work out as well as they wanted it to. You see, these people were believers. They were not converted in this moment. They were already believers. It says that those believers among them were coming and doing this. Those believers were confessing and divulging their practices. Bible commentator David Peterson says, The burning the scrolls was a way of repudiating what they contained and represented a greater trust in God to deliver them from their trouble and supply their needs. So what these, what these believers are doing is now they're, they're, they're being convicted by the Holy Spirit. They're responding in fear of the Lord, and they're saying, Only you, Lord. We trust in only you. We're putting this away. We're, we have no backup plan, in other words. Because they, they kept these books, they kept these scrolls, they kept parts of their lives as this backup plan, these, these you know, idolatrous uh, practices. And now they're saying, only you, God. And they were believers. They, this, this, should be, this shouldn't be lost on us. This should, this should really have an effect on us, an impact on us, that these were believers that were doing this. You would expect that in the moment of conversion, all of this stuff is wiped away. You think about, you think about coming in here and finding out that, uh, that somebody who's been a member here for a, for a number of years has some practice in their life that is just ungodly and it's, it's just wicked. You, you say, how could that, how could you possibly survive this long without having that eradicated in your lives? And that's just a false understanding of what happens at the moment of salvation, that we are not sanctified in a moment completely rid of every degree of sin. It's just not the case. God is continually doing his purging work in their lives. Listen, if your expectation is that once you're saved, that once you're converted, you just cease to sin, that belief is foreign to the Bible. Rather, temptation and sin and, and idolatry is an ongoing reality in the life of the believer. It shouldn't surprise us, therefore, when we're confronted with the reality of sin in our own lives or in the lives of someone else in this church or, or that you know. It shouldn't surprise us when our children sin or when our spouses sin, when our neighbors sin, or when you know, somebody that you really respect sins. That shouldn't surprise us. That's a faulty view of sin and the Christian life. Rather, it should be our expectation that God will continually expose areas, that he will continually expose areas in our life that need to be put to death. Other than that, there would be no need for Paul to exhort us in, in Colossians chapter 3, right? And in other places where he says, put to death, therefore, put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you. What is still earthly in you? He's talking to the church. He's talking to believers. Put to death what is earthly in you and to put on godly character, which is the result of God's spirit at work in us. We should pray and ask God to continue to do this work in our lives, that he would make us holy and happy people that make the gospel of Jesus Christ look very powerful and attractive. Listen, the, the doctrine of progressive sanctification, fancy terminology, progressive sanctification. So sanctification, the process by which we are made more and more into the image of Christ, and it's progressive. It's done in stages, more and more more like Jesus Christ. The doctrine of progressive sanctification means that as Christians, we will continue to be shaped by the chisel of God. We are, we are the clay in the potter's hands, and he is continuing to work. He's continued to, to take his chisel and his hammer and to say, okay, I want, I want this part away. And he's, and he's molding us like this. He's shaping us in a certain way, and he's continuing to do that until the day that we will one day be with him in glory. He's continuing to form us and shape us and remove things. And so we should anticipate God revealing areas in our lives that are out of step with his character. We should investigate areas that do not display the beauty of the gospel. As we look at our lives, we should consider that. Why is that, that that is there? And we should repent of every sin and the weight that so easily entangles anything that is out of step with the character of God. We want to repent of that. We want to own that. We want to repent of that. We want to come alongside you know, believers that we respect and that love us 
and say, would you please you know, help me in this area and benefit from the body of Christ? Listen, friends, if God isn't doing this in your life, if God isn't revealing areas in your life, if, if the act of repentance is an unusual activity, if it's been a while since you've confessed your sin to someone, you need to stop and ask, why is that? Why is that? Is it because I've achieved perfection? Is, is it because I'm, I'm, a, I'm a finished product? Or is it because maybe I've, maybe I've shut God out of my life or I've, I've put him in a box where I try to keep God here, but I, I don't want him to speak into the rest of my life? What we see here in Acts chapter 19 is a group of believers who are convicted of their, spin, of their sin and their, um, and their experience and the transforming effects of the gospel by the power of the Holy Spirit. They confess their sin. They repent of their, of their dishonest business practices. They exposed their, dece- their deceitful ways, and they destroyed their idols. They destroyed their idols. And it cost them a great deal. You may, you may have a note in your Bible when it says that, <clears throat> that they counted the value of them, and it, count, and it came to 50,000 pieces of silver. The note in my Bible says that today the equivalent of that would be $6 million. Can you imagine that? What a great act of repentance, a group of believers coming together and burning their idols worth $6 million. They didn't simply say, hey, there's other people that would value these idols. Let me go sell them to them. No, they were so passionate about purging them from their lives in this world that they destroyed valuable things in their lives. These people recognized, friends, that genuine discipleship involved letting go of what they treasured in order to enjoy the greater blessings of God. There's greater treasure to be had. You think of the parables of Jesus, of the man who sold all that he had to buy a field in which lay greater treasure than he had ever known. And it wasn't worth, you know, contemplating. He just did it because he saw the value. The gospel changes everything. It gives us a new heart, a new life, a new way of thinking, a new source of refuge. Our idols are no longer our source of refuge. These believers' willingness to burn stuff rather than sell it is evidence of the genuineness of their conversion. That's often a mark of the genuineness of someone's conversion is stark changes when they say, I'm, I am willing to let that go. I'm willing to cut off that sinful practice, that way of doing business, that way of relating to others. I'm no longer going to relate to other people the way that the world relates, unwilling to forgive holding their sin over them. I will, I will respond as God responds to me. So what is that this morning that God, God might be calling you to let go of? You may not have books of magic formulas or a shelf full of spiritual statues that you bow down to, but what is God doing? Where is God doing his good transforming work in your life? Where is that this morning for you? We may not have statues in our house, but we all have idols in our hearts. It's been said that our hearts are like factories, constantly creating new idols that we crave and worship. We may, we may not kneel before a statue in worship, but many today are driven into depression and struggle with eating disorders because making an idol out of a, out of a certain body image. Maybe we don't burn incense to an idol, but we, we raise money in our careers to a, to a place of... Um, to a, to a uh, high level of, of uh, cosmic proportions of, of respect and idealism. And so we therefore sacrifice our family and our community in order to achieve more wealth, more fame, more respect in the world. What is that for you? Idolatry can be defined as finding your joy or security in anything besides God. So maybe that's your kids, maybe that's your career, maybe that's you know, a certain type of relationship. It's anything that you can't be happy without. And they're not, usually, they're not usually bad things, it's usually good things that we want too much. In Thinking Through Idolatry, pastor and author Tim Keller lists out a number of different types of idols in the world today. I found the, four, the following four categories very helpful in diagnosing idolatry at work in my own life. One is power idolatry. Life only has meaning or I only have worth if I have power and influence over others. Second one is approval idolatry. Life only has meaning or I only have worth if I am loved and respected by fill in the blank. Comfort idolatry. Life only has meaning or I only have worth if I have this kind 
of pleasure experience or this particular quality of life or control idolatry. Life only has meaning or I only have worth if I'm able to get mastery over my life in the area of fill in the blank. Here's the thing. Whatever your idol, they will never satisfy you. They will never be for you what only God can be. If you, are, if you can't be happy apart from being married, then you will never be happy being married. You will make your spouse into, into your God, and they can never fulfill you the way that only God can fulfill you. Same thing with everything else. You, your career cannot be what defines you. Your children do not define you. Your money, be it a lot or little, does not define you. Your career does not define you. Your passions in life, I don't care what they are, apart from God, your passions will never fulfill you the way that only God is intended to. Apart from that, everything else, in the words of Jeremiah, is nothing but a broken cistern that does not quench your thirst. So wherever you're convicted this morning, whatever's coming to mind for you that God might be working on, that God might be looking to transform, wherever that is, whether you're harboring bitterness towards someone, hiding some sinful practice, hoping that nobody ever finds out, hoping that nobody finds out where you went this week in your, in your internet browsing, or the way that you did that business deal this week, whatever it is, if there's some area in your life that you want to change but are simply hopeless that you can actually really change, if you think that any part of your life is beyond redemption, friends, I have good news for you. The truth of the gospel is that the gospel, that God actually really transforms people. He actually really grants us victory over sin. He actually really gives us the strength to go to that person and reconcile, to go to that boss and to confess what you did wrong and to trust God with results. No area of sin in your life is beyond the reach of God's grace. God is inviting you this morning to confess those areas of your life that you've been holding back. Like these believers in Ephesus, to throw them into the fire to say, I'm not going to have any more of that. I am ridding my life of that category of idolatry to let go of those areas that you've been keeping in the dark, to expose them to the light of the gospel and to let God change you, to trade the treasures of this world for the treasures of God's kingdom forever. So the gospel will reshape your priorities, your life, and your manner of worth. It changes everything. And while it's costly, it's not without joy. Notice that when they responded in the fear of the Lord, you don't get this impression that it was a kind of mopey, scared kind of fear, but a holy, happy kind of fear. You can, imagine, you can imagine these believers seeing this fire and running over and saying, I've got stuff to throw in too. I'm going to confess this. I want to enjoy that kind of freedom. I want to enjoy the kind of freedom that I'm just, I'm just not afraid of somebody coming up to me and saying, hey, I, I know something about you. That, that doesn't shake you. See, I know who I am in Christ. I know my sins have been forgiven. I know who I am as a child of God. When they responded in the fear of the Lord, they realized that God was among them. And it says the name of the Lord Jesus was extolled. I have this picture of almost a worship service that they're singing as they're doing this. That's the picture in my mind. To extol, it says the, Lord, the name of the Lord Jesus was extolled among them. To extol is to praise enthusiastically. It's a word used often in the Psalms. Commanding that songs of praise be lifted up to God. Paul, at the end of the letter of, uh, of Romans, <clears throat> calls the church to extol the Lord. And here we find that as they were confessing their practices, as they were burning their idols, they were extolling the name of the Lord. Friends, God calls us to repent of all our idolatries. But when he frees us from those, he replaces them with himself. He doesn't simply call us to forsake the treasures of the world, but he promise, promises us the treasure of his kingdom. And this leads to joy and transforms us into a holy, happy people. And the result of all this work, verse 20, the, the, work of the, the word of the Lord continued to increase and to prevail mightily. Friends, that's what, that's what we're after, church. That's what we're after. That's why we're studying this book of Acts. That's why we come here week to week is because we are eager for the word of the Lord to increase and to prevail mightily in our lives and in our city and in our nation and in this world. 
And we all get to play a part in that work. Let's show, let's show the next generation what it looks like to be a holy nation, the bride of Christ, the church of God. The Lord will build his church. He is building his church, and the gates of hell will not stand against it. The question this morning is not whether or not we will accomplish his mission, but whether we will join him in his, in his good work of transforming his people and prevailing in this world. Please join me in prayer. Well, Father in heaven, we do thank you for the gift of your word. We thank you for speaking to us, for redeeming us, for transforming us, Father, from one degree of glory to another. And we pray, Father, that you would do your work this morning, that you would transform us, God. Help us, God, to be aware of your active work in our lives. Help us, Father, to respond, Father, to be aware that you know all, that you see all, that you will not be mocked. Lord, help us to lean in, to have a genuine relationship with you, to walk in purity before you and in this world. God, help us to be a happy and holy people, that you would continue to do your good work of transforming the lives of your people, destroying every area of idolatry, conforming us to the image of your Son. Help us, Father, to more and more accurately reflect your character and your glory to a lost and dying world. And this morning, Father, I pray for all of us, God, wherever we need help, wherever we need physical healing or release from bondage in some area of idolatry, God. Whatever relationship needs reconciling, God, I pray, Father, that you would work powerfully by your Holy Spirit, God. We pray this in Jesus' name.